Hello and welcome to Talking Tudors, a fortnightly podcast about the ever-fascinating Tudor dynasty. My name is Natalie Gruniger and I'll be your host and guide on this journey through 16th century England. Are you ready to step through the veil of time into the dazzling and dangerous world of the Tudor court? Without further ado, it's time to talk Tudors. everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Talking Tudors. I'm your host, Natalie Gruniger. Thank you so much for joining me today. As always, I'd like to start by thanking and acknowledging the wonderful listeners who continue to support my podcast on Patreon and extend a heartfelt thank you to everyone who's taken the time to rate and review the show. This really does make a difference. If you love the podcast and you never miss an episode, I invite you to join the Talking Tudors patron family. Visit patreon.com slash talking tutors for more information. Join the Talking Tutors patron family and in addition to receiving lots of tutor themed goodies, you'll have access to patron only monthly giveaways. May's prize is a copy of Tudor Mystery, the master of the Countess of Warwick, published to accompany the exhibition Tudor Mystery, a master painter revealed. The lucky winner will also receive a portrait miniature of Thomas Nivett. Patrons are also eligible to attend additional monthly talks that take place live on Zoom. This month, I'll be chatting to Aleary Lynn about Tudor textiles and fashion. Head over to my Patreon if you'd like to join us. You can also support the podcast and share your love of Tudor history with the world by buying Talking Tudors merchandise. There are a number of designs and products available, including phone cases, mugs, notebooks, and apparel. Check out all the products at talkingtudors.threadless.com. I would absolutely love to see pics of you wearing or using your Talking Tudors merch, so please do tag me on social media and use the hashtag #ILoveTalkingTudors. Now, on to today's episode, I'm excited that joining me on the show to talk about Jane Boleyn, Lady Rochford, is Dr. James Taff. Dr. Taff is a Tudor historian whose research focuses on the English royal household and the wider court, concentrating foremost on the households of Henry VIII and his six queens. Born in Birmingham, England, he studied at Queen Mary, University of London and University of Birmingham, before moving to the Northeast around four years ago to study for his PhD at Durham University, which he completed in 2022. He now lives in Newcastle, UK. Courting Scandal, The Rise and Fall of Jane Boleyn, Lady Rochford is his first publication. Our conversation's coming up straight after this short musical break, courtesy of guitarist John Sales. Welcome to Talking Tudors, James. How are you? I'm very well, thank you, Natalie. How are you today? I'm well, thank you. It's so lovely to have you on the show. So I think a good place for us to begin is you just maybe just introducing yourself to our listeners and just telling us a little bit about you and your background. Sure, yes, absolutely. So uh, my name is James and uh, 
I'm a Tudor historian, mostly focusing on royal servants and the Tudor royal household and the wider court as well. I went to university to study history and uh, stayed there for far too long and have studied history for as long as I can remember. <laughs> and I am particularly interested in uh, ladies in waiting and court politics. Uh, that's pretty much what my research has focused on for the past five years um, and mostly on the reign of Henry VIII. But I love all the Tudors and uh, particularly a big fan of this podcast because I do oh. love to talk Tudors. So, um, <laughs> but yes, and the uh, I recently finished university, recently graduated, and um, and I've just finished my first book. Fantastic. And thank you. It's lovely that you enjoy listening to the podcast. We are actually here to, to speak a little bit about your first book. So that is Courting Scandal, The Rise and Fall of Jane Boleyn, Lady Rochford. So tell us a little bit about why you chose Lady Rochford as the subject of your first book. Absolutely, yes. So um, Jane first came to my attention when I was an undergraduate at university, and my dissertation focused um, on the executions of Anne Boleyn and Catherine Howard. And I began researching the Queen's households then in more detail because they were quite central to the story. But Jane in particular arose as a leading figure. She was sort of the thread that tied together the two events because she's the only one really involved in both. And um, because of that, she's proven to me quite personally to be an excellent case study academically really um but if only then to satisfy my own curiosity I wanted to look at her particular career in more focus because I wanted to explain her motives that I'm sure I'm not the only one who has come across her and thought what was she thinking what what why why did she do that why why would she do that and just in trying to interpret her and trying to find Jane in the sources, I think she she was just always so, so extraordinary to me. I'm not sure if everyone will think the same way, but to me, she she struck a chord. And, um, and I think also, just in an academic sense, I wanted to tell the story of what it was like to serve the Queen in this period, from 1527 to 1547 especially, you know, as Henry sort of, Henry VIII traded wives and the Queen's household had to be discharged and servants disbanded and sent home and many of their careers were cut short and... Uh, Remarkably, Jane is one of the few who served many queens successively. She served five of Henry VIII's six queens. Um, so she became a really brilliant focal point to talk about survival at court. And I've just always been, you know, what the Tudors are like. I mean, how can you survive the Tudors? That's what was, that's what really drew me to Jane. How did she manage to survive all of this politics and the the tumult, you know, she she really hung, hung in in there, as long as she could anyway. My broader research on the Queen's household and the court felt like it could tell me more about Jane. But Jane herself told me a lot more about what I needed to know about the Queen's household and the court as well. So when we hear about Jane, often it's, of course, about her involvement with Catherine Howard or perhaps the role she played in the downfall of Anne and George Boleyn. So we don't really know that much, or we don't hear often about her early life and her childhood. So maybe do you want to tell us a little bit about that and maybe about how she actually got to court and how her career began there? Sure, yes, absolutely. So um, Jane was the daughter of Henry Parker, Baron Morley, um, who was a well-respected English peer and scholar. And he married Alice St. John, who was Jane's mother, and she herself was the daughter of Sir John St. John of Bletsoe. Unfortunately, we don't really know what Jane's childhood was like. Like so many of us in this period, this is just a complete, like we have no idea. There's just not enough evidence really to sustain. Um, but for Jane, there is a small exception because her name does come up in the accounts of Lady Margaret Beaufort, Henry VIII's grandmother. And those accounts do provide us with some hints. Um, but the main thing really is that in this period, because royal service, the way it worked was that if you had a tradition, if your family had served the king or queen or prince or princess before, usually there was sort of a nod to that tradition. And the next generation of Parkers or St. John's would also be appointed. And so Jane's parents, um, Henry and Alice, they both served Lady Margaret Beaufort in her household. And that sort of, I think, gave Jane a bit more a bit more of a claim to office later on when she was first appointed to Catherine of Aragon's household. But also Jane had some experience of, not what I wouldn't say experience of court, but experience of what that life might be like because her parents were presumably, we know, as, as we can presume from the accounts, Jane's parents remained in service and the Parker children did not necessarily live with their parents, but they were brought up to court or to Lady, Lady Margaret Beaufort's court anyway, quite often. So, and also the accounts give us some indication of how much Margaret cared for Henry and Alice, as even though they were her servants, they were clearly dear to her. And by extension, so were their children. And so 
although it's difficult to really make much of it because it's just a few entries in the accounts, you know, the fact that Lady Margaret Beaufort covered the costs of milk and bread and sugar candy for the Parker children, little very human aspects like that that come through in the accounts. And she paid one of her own gentlewomen to stay with the Parker children, um, Elizabeth Massey. So we have these little glimpses of what Jane's life might have been like early on, but it's all they're all they're so brief and they're, they're they're very difficult to build very much on unfortunately but but then we know a little bit more about Jane as she comes to court more than probably most because I think because of what happens later on with Jane more people feel the need to remark on her life and her career so George Cavendish Cardinal Wolsey's uh, gentleman usher he said made the comment that Jane had been brought up in the court from a young age and so you have this image of her as like a child running around the court wreaking havoc but actually he probably meant more like when she was 16 she was appointed as a maid of honor to Catherine of Aragon's household and we know eventually she did serve as a maid but we don't know exactly when and um, I hope your listeners are going to get used to we don't know we don't know but I mean the the thing is about Jane is that it's the little tantalizing hints that draw that draw me in I really wanted to see what we could make of these little scraps of evidence and um, so yeah Jane how how Jane really got her start at court is a really intriguing question and I kind of like Jane as an example of all these different facets that and all these different conditions or qualifications I don't like to use the word qualifications it sort of makes it sound like she had a CV or something but really Jane because positions were so highly coveted in the Tudor royal household what recommended Jane for service or who recommended Jane for service was probably similar to very many other young girls too so it could have been her noble heritage it could have been her beauty certainly that was a prerequisite for young girls who wanted to attend at court but even for Jane, we have no idea what her appearance was really like because we don't have any portraits or contemporary descriptions. But we can presume that she was at least educated and taught to behave in a manner that would have been befitting a royal servant and almost not trained, but sort of reared for a court career. She, she There would have been that expectation that eventually she would have to hold that honour. And um, yeah, I mean, the most important thing is who. Was there a patron? Was it who 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 sent a petition on Jane's behalf? We don't know. But as I said before, the fact that her parents served Lady Margaret Beaufort, there's like a friendship with the crown between the Parkers or the Morleys, as they probably would have been more well known, and the Tudors essentially. And I think that's why Jane is appointed later on. She has this claim to serve at court. Wonderful. So you mentioned, obviously, that she at some point comes to serve Catherine of Aragon. And we know that, of course, Anne Boleyn was at some point also serving Catherine of Aragon. So when the, the Boleyn star sort of starts really rising, are there conflicts here with Jane's loyalty? Because she's serving Catherine, but then, of course, she becomes part of the Boleyn family. So maybe tell us a little bit about what you discovered about their ascendancy and how Jane kind of handled it, if we know anything about that. Well, certainly, yes. That's a wonderful question because it's the question I had when thinking about Jane. And I'll say it right from, from the get-go. We we don't know enough about her relationship with Catherine of Aragon, but I've done a lot of research into this dynamic of serving the Queen, Queen and her servant, and what the expectations were. And Catherine of Aragon had a remarkable talent for winning loyalty. She has this household that are so staunchly loyal to her in spite of their own, when it's when it's more convenient for them to be disloyal to her, they still remain loyal to her. And so there is this impression from the sources that definitely there is a conflict during the Berlin ascendancy. Do I side with Catherine and do I side with Anne? And perhaps none were more personally touched by that question than Jane herself, because Jane definitely would have served Catherine for several years, but Anne's her sister-in-law. Once she marries George Boleyn, there really isn't... Some some would say she didn't really have a choice. And although I can kind of understand that, and I would probably concede that her future definitely lay with the Boleyns once Anne Boleyn had sort of caught the king's attention and the Boleyns were sort of becoming more and more prominent at court. I don't think it's so cut and dry. I think you have to acknowledge that Jane's loyalties would have been more complex than that, much more, much more kind of conflicting, inherently conflicting. So she didn't really play a central role in these years, I don't feel, but loyalty was really important to the Tudors. And I think in in particular, Henry VIII, one thing that I've discovered really is that he really cared about the Queen's household and its loyalties. And he would manipulate them and force it into a position where it gave recognition to his true Queen. So Whereas the household previously served to make Catherine a queen, he now wanted it to make Anne the queen. And if Jane had decided, no, I'm not going to serve Anne Boleyn, I'm just going to stay with Catherine, or she was really stubborn to the to jumping ship, then it would have looked bad. 
you know, optically. And I think that that is her the role that Jane played. She played, she had this sort of familial coherence. All of the Berlins who served Catherine of Aragon suddenly find their way in Anne Boleyn's household. And most of your listeners would probably think, well, of course they would. I mean, that's that's a given. But what I think I try and show in the book is that it's not that straightforward. It's not that, oh, I'm a Berlin, so I'm going to go side with the Berlins. And I think Jane is an excellent example of how loyalties had to be aligned or realigned. And the nature of loyalty itself is something that I really tried to grasp, grapple with in this book, really. And I, I hope that I managed to do that. I, I, I think I did. Absolutely. I think you did. I, I very much enjoyed reading your book. And I think it gives us a lot of food for thought. You know, I think it's so important to keep an open mind, even if we have our sort of set positions and ideas, which of course we do. But um, I, I agree with so much of what you've just said, James. Like I'm just thinking about the conflict and the tension that you're talking about. And I think so often it's forgotten or it's kind of, as you say, it's painted more black and white. And it's the same with Anne Boleyn. I think she herself would have felt tension and conflict because she too served loyally for several years before Henry decided to, you know, turn his attention to her. So I think it's really interesting and important, I think, to highlight that they're humans, that they would have had moments of confusion, of not knowing what to do next, of all that kind of stuff. So that's really, really interesting. Tell us a little bit about what you think it meant for Jane to serve in the household of a queen and the court of a king as well. Sure, yeah. So this was essentially the the core bread and butter question of my doctoral research. And I, I mean, I'm still trying to answer it today, if I'm being honest, because there's this just it's such a broad question. But the book just draw quite heavily from that research. And I think that really helped put Jane into a certain context, just to understand. I mean, this was, yes, she had her life, but we don't know very much about her life. But what we do know a lot more about is her career, I felt. And um, the career of any royal servant really can be defined between two things. So it's like the office that they held, the position, which is very formal and institutional. And then you've got the relationships that they form as a result of their attendance at court. So office is quite straightforward. Jane would have been a maid of honor for many years, which would have meant that she would have accompanied the queen and would have moved with her from palace to palace, serving in the presence chamber in particular. But in the later years, she would have been a lady of the privy chamber, which is a lot more intimate and personal. And she would have been dressing and undressing the queen, washing and bathing her, waiting on her at table. And although those duties are very clear cut. That only tells probably barely half the story, really. That's that's the formal expectations of what that role is. What it actually was like to serve is a much bigger, more complex question that I'm just fascinated with. And one of the key points about serving, I think, is the relationships. So it's not just the relationship with the queen as their mistress, but also the king as their sovereign. His presence was always there and you have to account for that too and then there's the wider court you have this network of people that you're surrounded by so there's all these relationships that Jane would have had and I try and tease out as many of them as I can but it's it's a it's a difficult thing to recover human interactions because who would have recorded them and why and it, you build a lot on what we know was the expectation of a relationship between. So what was this dynamic between a mistress and her servant? What was the dynamic between a subject and their sovereign? And you try and do as much with that as possible and then take the really circumstantial evidence and say, hmm, well, Jane said this, but in the context of this, and that, that's what I hope to do. That's I try and make sense of the, the smaller things that we have that of Jane that have survived. Oh, but but to go sort of back to the question. So if office and what what the position that Jane held conferred a certain amount of status and authority and it sort of denoted her rank in the hierarchy, that order would have been circumvented by the queen and the king because the queen and the king were not ordering their households incredibly formally. They were informal and they were human. And some servants were shown more favor than others. Some were granted access more often than others. Some were more trusted than others. And I think Jane, Jane's career is a great example because she has she had a remarkable talent of winning the trust of queens, I think. But also going back to loyalty again, there, she certainly had some kind of a relationship with the king. A tense one, I would say. I don't think he liked her very much. <laughs> and uh, but probably saw her as being a sort of necessary necessary piece of the puzzle at, at court. She became a formidable character in her own right, but that was through her service and her presence and her long-standing sort of attendance at court. So I know this is a, a huge question, but can you tell us a little bit about what Jane's relationships were like with some of those key players, perhaps, that you've, that you've talked about in your book? Definitely, yes. So Jane's career spanning two 
tumultuous decades, she had to serve five of Henry VIII's six queens. And I do, I try and explore in depth what a relationship was like between a mistress and her servant. And the key thing really is that a queen's household was fought very much to be under the charge of the queen. And all these interactions between a mistress and her servant were supposed to be ritualized and sort of constrained by this this custom. But ordinances and of the household and all these rules and instructions could only dictate so far how their behavior was and what their interactions were like. What we're really missing often in the sources is what happened in between. What happened when there was no chronicler there scribbling down every detail or the ambassador, you know, having his ear at the door trying to hear what was going on. And I think those interactions, when they do come through, when the, when they manage to, when there are cracks in, in that sort of wall, they strike me as so much more human and so much more sort of emotional rather than political. I'm I'm so used to looking at relationships in political context because I did start as a political historian. But looking this time at more emotional entanglements between queens and their servants, I was really struck. I thought that the relationships would be more, well, I, I guess, rit- ritualized and constrained because of the difference in status and just the nature of service in my, my head was going to be very much like I'm me and you're you and you're my servant. And now we're going to keep that distance between us. But actually, it's completely the opposite. And although we're lacking specifics of how Jane felt about Catherine of Aragon, even how she felt about Anne Boleyn, there are a great exhaustive amount of evidence for her sort of relationship with Catherine Howard because of the fall of Catherine Howard and the depositions that have survived. So when these interactions are generally lost to us, in this case, the, we have we hear actual conversations between the queen and her servant, and they talk very familiarly and very as if they're friends and they're, they're companions. Although Catherine has been elevated to the, the status of queen, you know, Jane speaks to her as if they're equals in some ways, uh, not, not all the time publicly that she would have to have shown her all the reverence that she deserved. But it's fascinating to me, this relationship, it's it's exactly what our relationships are like today. You know, they're, they're much more real. And that is what I really wanted to draw out from the sources. So in terms of queens, that's the dynamic that I focus on in the book. Um, you can imagine her relationship with the king was kind of how, how, how many of them were. She's sort of cautious and maybe slightly fearful. But um, but that's the, it's the relationship between a queen and her servant that I really, really tried to focus on. And I, I hope I managed to draw it out. Yeah, I think I absolutely loved all that. Your your work on the Queen's household and those relationships was one of my favourite parts, I have to say, of the book. I really oh, enjoyed well, thank that. Thank you so much. Really, really enjoyed that. So what about just, I'm just thinking, because I know she obviously also had a bit of a relationship with Princess Mary, for example. What did you find about those two women? Well, I, I'm going to say right now that I, I a lot of the work that I drew on her relationship with Princess Mary has was from other scholars. So I didn't do a, have to do a lot of work on this because uh, Refa Warnick and David Starkey had both looked at this relationship between the Parkers and Mary in particular because of the we're trying to get an answer about the fall of Anne Boleyn, desperately trying to understand where did Jane's loyalties lie. So a lot of people, I say a lot of people, a few historians have already looked at this relationship. I didn't feel like I came to any different conclusion. The sources are not adequate enough to say without a doubt that Jane was pro Mary and therefore anti Boleyn in these years. But there is certainly enough, certainly enough to make you think. Hmm. Okay. So. Why would she be friends with Mary in these years when Mary was so clearly opposed to Anne Boleyn and the Boleyn ascendancy? And they were on opposite sides. But Jane clearly was friends with Mary in the later years. Jane's father especially was very close with Mary and seems to have revered her. And again, it's got it comes back to the question of loyalty. It's not so straightforward that I'm a Boleyn, so I'm going to be loyal to the Boleyns. And the the little hints, I mean, there's that great source where we we thought Jane might have been at a demonstration in Mary's favor in 1535, but it's, it's probably a lot of nonsense. Very <laughs> unfortunately, because it doesn't. It's very hard to sort of su- sustain that source. But that's I thought I thought when I couldn't prove that that my idea of this relationship between Jane and Mary was out the window. But then there's all these sort of inferences in accounts and little connections, which you know circumstantially you might think, oh, that's not really a big deal. But the relationship that really matters is the one between her father and Mary, which is not just between a nobleman and a princess. They clearly corresponded. They clearly got on. And familial loyalty was powerful. And we keep, we often see Jane as a Boleyn and that so easily forget that she was a Parker as well. And the Parkers have this matrimonial and sort of neighboring alliance with the Boleyns. But I think that they have a sort of 
they have a lot more going on. And I, I would love to see more studies of the Parkers. And, and I know there's some work being done right now. I think it's Melita Thomas who's working on the networks of Mary, Mary the First. So I just think, yes, Mary is an I wouldn't say she's understated, but the Mary's networks, Mary's relationships, and Jane being one of them, but especially the Parkers, fascinating. Would love to see more work on that. And um, and I do think it's a piece of the puzzle. I do think that trying to understand Jane's position as not being inextricably tied to the Berlins, Mary is a great example of how that might be. She's not, you know, she's not the she's not totally stuck in the Berlin black hole, if you will. And I think, James, it's time that we dive into some pretty murky and controversial waters here and and discuss. I'd really like to hear what your thoughts are on Jane's role in the fall of Anne and George Berlin. I think if people have read my book, they kind of know where I stand on this, but I am more than happy to be open and and listen to this. And because, you know, it's fine to have differing (laughs) interpretations. Like there's no problem with that is what I want people to kind of understand, I suppose. So tell us what you think her role was, please. Absolutely. Yes. So I'll I'll preface this by saying it's open to interpretation in some ways. And I completely have the most respect for everyone else's views on this. I have a habit sometimes of stating my arguments as if, you know, it's the it's that way or the highway. Like I, I, I try and sound confident and bold because I think that makes for a good read. And I am pretty confident about Jane's involvement to some extent. But as you say, it's it's murky. And it's there's definitely room for interpretation, and I I don't want to discount that. But I'll I'll, I'll make my case now for your yes, listeners as, your as I see it. <laughs> um, so Jane's motives in fifteen phase six, so why she provided evidence that needed to be reassessed, definitely were often found in the older historical accounts that some suggested she was jealous of George's relationship with Anne Boleyn, that she was embittered. That certainly that cannot be proven. There's evidence to the contrary that she was actually quite fond of Anne at some point too. And there's the whole, she went to petition on George's behalf in 1536 too. So there's a lot, we can't really say very much about hostility or resentment. Although I do make some suggestion that that's not, again, improbable considering Jane was essentially stuck in exile in 1536. But what we can prove, I think, is that she was involved and that she played perhaps not the role, not the central role, but she definitely furnished the case of the prosecution in my eyes. And this is all about evidence for me. And while certain things are not conclusive, this for me is conclusive. And there's enough evidence that the burden is on everybody else to to show why do these sources exist? Why did, for instance, Eustace Chapuis uh, signpost us to this comment that Um, Anne had apparently said to Jane, the king had neither the skill nor the virility to satisfy a woman. And that comment could only realistically have then come to the prosecution from Jane. The second piece of evidence is one which is lost to us. It's a journal by someone called Anthony Anthony. So Anthony was a surveyor at the Tower of London in 1536. And we know he wrote an account of Anne and George's fall because the historian Gilbert Burnett consulted Anthony's journal before it was then lost to us. And that historian claimed Jane had carried many stories to the king. That's what he says, carried many stories. And I argue in my book that because Burnett makes it clear which sources he is using, the origin of the claim that Jane carried many stories is surely Anthony's journal. And again, because that's lost to us, it's murky and it's very... Uncon- it's like not unconvincing, but very un- very unsatisfactory. That to me is that needs to be explained. You know that why would Burnett, who was who was perfectly reasonable in the rest of his suggestions about Anne Boleyn, why would he suggest that Jane carried many stories? Where is what's the origin of that claim? And logic would say it's it's Anthony's journal. But the one the, the third piece which really gets on my nerves, and I'm trying trying not to get riled up here, but for me, Jane, if Jane didn't provide evidence. Why do her contemporaries later suggest that she did? And I know that part of the revisionist take on Jane's life is one of her biographers suggests that John Fox, the English martyrologist, was the origin of this supposed myth. Jane betrayed her husband and her sister-in-law in 1536. And because John Fox was writing in the reign of Elizabeth I, Anne's daughter, by blaming Jane, we vindicate the late queen. But There's enough evidence predating John Fox's work and Elizabeth's reign, which essentially proves that that many of Jane's immediate contemporaries knew and understood that she had a role and that she had betrayed them. 
And it's clear enough from that to me, although, the, again, the evidence is unsatisfactory in some ways, the burden is to explain why would they say that? And to say that either John Fox was slandering Jane's name, George Cavendish was sort of making up what he said, I, I think that's very difficult. Just because we want to believe that Jane was innocent in this particular time doesn't allow us to then say, well, that's not reliable evidence. I, I want an explanation. I want to know why everyone says she betrayed them. That seems like a very strange thing to crop up if she wasn't even involved in 1536. So that there's all this, all that evidence together really <laughs> makes me think that she was definitely involved. Um, then there's the circumstantial evidence, which is probably not really even worth mentioning. But for me, the one that I always come back to is why did Jane remain at court after the fall of the Berlins? The fact that she served Jane Seymour, who would probably rather have been served by, you know, a chicken than <laughs> than Jane than Jane Rochford was is just extraordinary. And why when we clearly know the king doesn't like her very much, why did the king then get involved in securing her jointure and things like that? It's it's the fact that Jane does not completely disappear into obscurity is too much of a coincidence for me. It's like that really begs the begs the question. But yes, I, I hope I've made my case there. Probably not very coherently. I apologize if that made no sense. I would <laughs> no, urge your listeners to go and read the book. I'm better on the page. No, you pose some very good questions. And I think it's important for us all to, to think about those things, even if we look at it slightly differently. So, you know, I, I encourage our listeners to definitely read your book and make up their own minds and have a look at the evidence themselves. So it, it is tantalizing, though, her long career at court. I, I agree with you. It's very interesting. So let's talk a little bit about Jane's own downfall now. And of course, her involvement with the affair between Catherine Howard and Thomas Culpepper. This is the one that kind of gets me going, what is happening here? So, you know, <laughs> tell us your thoughts on that. Absolutely. Yes. This is probably where Jane really caught my attention because the role she played as this sort of in between of a, an affair between a queen and a gentleman of the Privy Chamber, I can't think of a worse position to be caught in. And what then the the immediate suggestion in your mind is, well, she probably didn't have a choice. Who would who would willingly go into that fire? You know, who would who would make that mistake on purpose? And that's what I really wanted to know. I wanted to understand why would Jane, who for years before showed herself to be savvy and politically astute, why would she find herself in the most foolishly impossible position that she was no way she was ever going to extricate herself from, really? So that's that was a question that definitely preyed on my mind. And although it's clear enough that Jane was intimately involved in plotting the affair and in making sure that it carried on in a sense. We didn't really know her motives. And yeah, as you say, many have speculated and it's there's so many theories. And I mean, I would be doing them a disservice if I just mentioned my own. But um, but there are popular theories about this idea of Jane being a widow who was starved of affection and she may have obtained a sort of vicarious thrill or voyeuristic pleasure from arranging and observing this affair um, sort of living out fantasies through Catherine, essentially. I think that's plausible. I think that's OK. Jane sort of supposedly sexually frustrated, someone says, may have even harbored affection for Culpepper again. Sounds ridiculous, but she did send him bracelets and gifts yes. and things like that. And I'm just like, no, OK, Jane, what's that about? What are you doing there? And um, and then there's there's other ones like uh, just that she might have just been predisposed to having a, a talent for intrigue. And she loved to get involved in all of these plots. And that's maybe a little bit harder to prove, but also plausible. You know, it's difficult to prove what someone's mentality is, but she is involved in a lot in these years. I mean, it's like her name doesn't stop coming up in the source material. And then it makes you think, well, what, there must be something there. What's going on? Why is Jane always finding herself involved? Is she meddling? And I, I like to believe that, believe that she was. I won't necessarily spoil exactly why I think she was involved, just in case your readers do want to, sorry, your listeners do want to read the book. But the main thing for me is that Jane did have a motive. And I do think that there is reason to be applied and there is logic to be applied to this situation and this scenario. And the... What I try and argue against is this idea that Jane was dragged into the affair against her own will. I don't believe that. I don't think the sources speak to that. They make it very clear that she was involved and actively encouraging it. And there's, I don't believe that all of the depositions who call Jane out, essentially, and who pin the blame on Jane, and I don't believe that they're just making it up. It, there's, a, there's a ring of truth but to a lot of the stories that come through about Catherine Howard and from the depositions, I believe a lot of a lot, even though under pressure, I believe a lot of those a lot of this uh, evidence in those depositions is true. Some of the conversations are so real and so you just would you just wouldn't make them up. 
And it speaks to a relationship between Catherine and Culpepper, which I know it's not very popular nowadays to say that it was a genuine romantic or genuine sort of lustful relationship, but that's exactly what it was. And that's the only way to read that evidence in my mind. So Jane becoming involved, she had a motive. I like to say there was a method to her madness. She was no fool and she was no pawn. Yeah, I think in in recent years, you know, people have tried to rehabilitate her her reputation because she has, of course, been presented quite negatively, especially I find in like fictional accounts and, and shows and documentaries. She's kind of awful, really, the way she's presented. So <laughs> tell us about your view of Jane, the woman you came to know during your research. You know, do you think she deserves this this really kind of negative reputation? Oh, well, deserves <laughs> is a difficult word because I'd like to think that we should give the benefit of the doubt to most people who died 500 years ago and who can't really speak for themselves anymore. Saying that, I don't know why revisionist history should get in the way of a good story when there's evidence for it. You know, some narratives need to be corrected because they were sort of made up in a sort of fanciful way and without real evidence to base them on. But I do find that, and yes, I do think that sort of the moral judgmental tone, which has been cast about Jane for years, for centuries, that needed to be revised. That was outdated. We needed to we needed to consider Jane in a more fair, sort of thoughtful way. But I don't think that all of those accounts, which saw Jane as being this sort of vicious, spiteful, cruel, heartless, malicious, even murderous woman, I don't think those accounts were necessarily far off the mark. Yes, the tone is wrong, but were their conclusions wrong? And the alternative is uh, the revisionist view of Jane is to see her as being a bit hapless and blameless and a bit oblivious to what's going on around her. And I think that is the distortion. That is that is like reading all of the evidence and refusing to believe what's in front of you, because it's there's enough there for me to convince me that Jane was not hapless and blameless. And the words like saying, saying things like spiteful, you know, wow, well, yeah, we can't really prove that she was spiteful and cruel. Again, that's very judgmental. That's very sort of, that's taking the wrong approach. But I wouldn't necessarily say she was always good or innocent either. And that's what, that's what really inspired me to write the book because my view of Jane was not the popular view. And I felt like the best way to explain that and to explain why I think Jane or not deserves her negative reputation, but more a villain than she was a hero, as some have tried to make out that she was, is because that, that was just the, the way the evidence came to me. You know, that's 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 how I saw it. But I mean, many were outraged by this notion of her being this wicked wife, you know, and that's why there's such a moral judgmental tone for centuries. But setting that aside, was she involved in the fall of Anne and George Berlin? Yes. Was she involved in plotting this affair for Catherine Howard with, with a gentleman of the Privy Chamber? Yes. And and those don't necessarily make her a bad person, but you can't pretend like she wasn't involved in some real capacity. And not everyone would have been perfectly pleasant or innocent back then. That's what that's what really intrigues me is sometimes you, a revisionist approach can go too far. So representing Jane as being this sort of pariah of Tudor history and wanting to vindicate her, wanting the readers to admire or to like her, I think that goes too far. I think that that portrayal of Jane is largely fictional. And I don't mean that in a in a terribly dismissive way. I just mean it to say it takes a lot of imagination to see Jane as a scapegoat, in my opinion. And to excuse her of any wrongdoing, because I think the evidence does suggest that Jane was quite meddlesome, sometimes maybe even calculating and potentially even ambitious. And I suppose why that's important for me to say is because by saying Jane wasn't involved or was innocent or dragged into it, completely strips her of any agency of her own, any interest in this character and in this narrative and why Jane is relevant to the conversation goes completely out the window if you assume that she was an innocent and just a pawn. And for me, again, I, I admire her and I find her compelling because of her negative reputation. And the question of whether she deserves that reputation, maybe she's not evil or wicked, but I I think that she was, I certainly don't think I would have got on with her. You know, I, <laughs> I don't think many got on with her. I think, I don't think I come away particularly liking her, but I find her extraordinary. And I think she was a formidable character. I think she was a force to be reckoned with. That's the Jane that I want his history to remember. I don't, reducing her to, to this sort of faceless pawn to me is the opposite of what we should be doing as historians. We should take what is fascinating and extraordinary and put it right out there, even if it's ugly. 
you know, even if it's not, even if it's unpleasant and it doesn't really fit with our views, you know, that's why Jane is interesting. That's why she makes a great read. Well, I can certainly hear your respect for her, which I think is is wonderful. And I too think she's compelling and fascinating. And I do think we have a tendency to to want to um, label or not label, but package people neatly. You know what I mean? Either kind of yeah, saint or yeah. sinner. And of course, human beings are grey characters, complex characters. So, you know, there is a need, I think, to acknowledge the complexity and the layered nature of a human that, you know, whether they lived 500 years ago or your your best friend today, like, I think that's really absolutely, important to, to acknowledge that. So thank you. This has been such an interesting discussion. And like I say, I very much enjoyed your book. I thought it was brilliant. I loved learning about the Queen's household. That was one of my real favorite parts of it. But um, James, I can't let you go just yet, because I need to ask you one more thing. And that is for okay. a Tudor takeaway. So I ask all my guests for something for our listeners to go off and explore after the episode. So do you have a takeaway for us? Certainly, yes. Um, going off of what you said there about the Queen's household, a lot of my research did find its way into the book, but a lot of it didn't. And fortunately, there is another excellent book coming out very soon by Dr. Nikki Clark, uh, Dr. Nicola Clark, who is working on a book on ladies in waiting in the reign of Henry VIII. That would be my true to take away. Keep your eyes peeled for that because that is going to be extraordinary. And I, I really have appreciated the feedback about what people have said about the book in terms of telling people what it was like to be in the Queen's household, what it was like to serve at court. I'm so thrilled with that. And I'm so pleased that that is what people get out of it. And I think we need more work on the Tudor court. We need more updated and more new new perspectives. And that's what I'm really looking forward to about Nikki's book is there's got, it's just going to be incredible. Wonderful. I'm so looking forward to that as well. I think that's such a fascinating topic. And I'm looking forward to more work from you. Are you working on anything new at the moment? Oh, uh, thank you. Um, at the moment, I am taking a very <laughs> a much deserved break. Yes. I uh, um, no, I, I I can't put it down. I love I love history so much, and I, I love the Tudors. And even when I think I'm taking a break, <laughs> I'm still reading, and my mind is working and it's ticking and it's thinking. Oh, I wonder how this would go here, and that's an interesting letter. Let me read that again. And I'm in two minds. I I like the idea. I really enjoy researching and writing, and I'm finding it much more peaceful now that I'm outside of academia. <laughs> I kind of I'm much more like, oh, okay, let me just do it how I want to do it, rather than how I think someone else wants me to do it. And um, so I'm I'm still researching. I'm still writing. I think I've got a lot more to say about service and the Tudor royal household and the and the wider court. And that, if if anything, the reign of Henry VIII, it has my heart. So. If anyone's to expect anything from me, I mean, you can you can follow me on on Twitter um, at Tudor Taff if you're particularly keen. But um, I'm sort of insisting on a, shutting all of the blinds and getting just going to bed for a very long time because I'm just I'm quite tired. But um, and I, as I imagine many many uh, researchers are when they finally finish something, it's it's a wonderful experience. But uh, and. I, I remember saying to a friend, never again. But yes, no, I'm yeah. already, my my brain is already saying, oh, well, how about this? What about this? So, yeah. Absolutely. I totally understand what you're saying. I think I've said never again four or five times now. So, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and then slowly, as you say, a thought, a thought kicks in. And then, yeah. So, well, thank you so much, James. Again, this has been really fascinating. And thank you for talking to you with us. No problem. Thank you for having me. Well, that brings us to the end of this episode of Talking Tudors. Thank you so much for joining us. I absolutely love to hear from listeners, so if you have any comments or suggestions or just want to say hi, please get in touch with me via my website, www.onthetudortrail.com, where you'll also find show notes for today's episode. If you've enjoyed the show, please share the podcast with friends and family, and don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review. I also invite you to join our Talking Tudors podcast group on Facebook, where you can interact with other Tudor history lovers and hear all the behind-the-scenes news. You'll also find me on Twitter. My handle is on the Tudor Trail and on Instagram as the most happy 78. It's time now for us to re-enter the modern world. As always, I look forward to talking Tudors with you again very soon. Mm -hmm.